okay. Yes, I can see that in days now. Great. Welcome, everybody who's joining us. Yeah. Welcome, Anne. I see Fred. Kevin, welcome, Angela. Welcome, Arlie. Okay, okay. I got I to gotta go. Elizabeth, Ines. I guess I will wait. Yeah, we'll wait just for a Welcome minute. Morgan. For the people to come in. Welcome, Yvonne, Vivica. Welcome, welcome, Ruth. Wonderful to have you all with us. Yeah, so I guess we can start now. Do you hear me very well? Okay. Okay. So, hi, everyone. I'm Hal Ali, the coordinator for Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnership and Easter Island. So before we start, I just want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and we will post it later on our website, www.globalhealth.ie and www.ester.eu okay. and also in our social media channel. Live streaming is also available in, on our Facebook page, Irish Global Health Network. So before I introduce my co-host and the speakers, let me give you a quick orientation on how to use Zoom webinar. It's a bit similar to the normal Zoom, but with your experience as an attendee, your video and audio are disabled at this time. But if you have any questions, you can raise your hand and we will be back to you later when, you, when we open the floor for the questions. Otherwise, you can use the questions and answer feature in the bottom of the screen. You will find an icon of it. So according to your preference as well, you can choose how you would like to see the videos of the panelists. There is a feature in the top right of the screen, so you can choose either the gallery view or the speaker only view in case you prefer to see one speaker at the time. Now, let me welcome everyone to the launch of conversations on COVID-19 webinar series. It's a place for personnel working in global health and healthcare, where we exchange information and ideas with the experts in the field. This is the first webinar in the series, and we will continue to produce one webinar weekly on Fridays at 1 p.m. GMT. Each week, we will host two or three experts to talk about relevant COVID-19 pandemic topics, discuss certain aspects related to your work within the context of COVID-19, answer some of your urgent questions, and hopefully help you gain some, answer, some certainty in this ambiguous time. As this webinar aims to assist you and help you out, we encourage you to suggest the topics that you would like to discuss and send us your pressing questions. And we will try our best to come up with the answers either on the coming webinars or on our webpage. Now I will hand over to my co-host, Nadine Ferris Franz, the Operation Director of Irish Global Health Network, who will then introduce the speakers and lead the panel discussion. Hi, Nadine. Great, thank you, Hala. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, lovely to see so many of you with us at the moment. We're at fifty-three participants, so you're all welcome, and it's still uh, is still rising. So, um, welcome, welcome. Um, and as we go through, please do ask yeah. questions in the question and answer function um, in the bottom of the screen. So we're delighted to be able to um, contribute in some way at this really, um, really unusual time. Um, so today we have with us um, three wonderful speakers. Um, many of you will know, will know them very well. We have Rory Brewer, who himself is a medical doctor, a public health specialist, and also Professor Emeritus and former head of the Department of Public Health and Epidemiology at the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, Rory, thank you for, uh, for agreeing to jump into this with us today. Um, and Rory is going to talk to us a little bit. He's going to give us an overview of the current European response to COVID and just a little bit looking at the long-term outlook. So thank you for that, Rory. Um, we have Dermot McLean. Um, wonderful that you could join us, Dermot. Dermot is in Malawi at the moment. He's the Deputy Head of Mission in Irish Aid in Longwy. And Dermot is just gonna give us just a glimpse of the current situation in Malawi um, in terms of preparedness and in terms of the challenges. And, you know, we hope to facilitate a little bit of what can we, what has been learned from the Irish experience so far, even though it's very, um, 
it's very new and, and still emerging day by day. So Dermot, thank you for, uh, for being with us. It looks very warm where you are, warmer than here. <laughs> and uh, Niall Roach, um, delighted Niall could be with us. Um, Niall is a lecturer. He's also a board member of the Irish uh, Global Health Network, an environmental health officer by background. And Niall runs a public health module on the Masters in humanitar humanitar um, Humanitarian Action in UCD. Um, and Niall is going to help us with his expertise, just look at various aspects around water, health and sanitation. He's been talking about this for many years and suddenly all of us are now talking about it um, so we're going to you know ask Niall to look a little bit around the um, the relevance of, of his experience um, for Ireland but also for partner countries so let's kick off if we can um, Rory we might come to you and just um, just to kind of kind of set a context for us in terms of you know can you give us just an overview of, um, of you know what do we know so far around transmission and what have we learned from other countries so far so kind of over to you Rory uh, thank you, Nadine. I think to try and simplify it uh, uh, for, for myself and hopefully uh, for others, I think we're really looking at three broad types of epidemic um, globally at the moment. Uh, what we have seen in, in Southeast Asia, in China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea is uh, effective suppression. We've seen um, uh, the, the large peak of the epidemic being interrupted uh, and we've seen this reduction to actually eliminate cases. Um, Hala, you might actually just put, put up a slide there now. Okay. okay. So what, what we're seeing in Europe is uh, countries attempting to suppress the epidemic, um, but uh, in practice uh, not achieving uh, the degree of suppression that was possible uh, to achieve in China. Those of us in, in Ireland will have seen this uh, slide, which is from the government, from the, uh, which shows uh, what, what the objective here is, which is to dampen the epidemic uh, so that the cases are spread out over time. We see this horizontal uh, a line, a serrated line there, which represents the capacity of the healthcare system to uh, cope with the epidemic, particularly uh, intensive care beds, uh, respirators, uh, flattening it out over time so as to uh, um, uh, not allow the epidemic to uh, overwhelm the health services. I think the, the third epidemic that we're going to see, and I, I think this is the one we should focus on, and I know Dermot will be able to speak to it a bit, is what are we going to see in low resource settings that cannot bring this a uh, set of interventions um, uh, we won't be able to resource them uh, and, and achieve the population coverage. If you go to the second slide there, we'll see what the interventions are. And, and most of us are, are uh, pretty familiar with them. They're at the individual level, case isolation uh, in the home, which involves uh, detecting the virus, contact tracing, and um, home, uh, voluntary home quarantining of all household members. And we're seeing uh, three sets of population interventions. Social distancing of the whole population, focus on the under 70 year olds, or uh, closure of schools, universities. And in terms of how long this is going to last, really we're looking down the road. I think that if there is a message here, it's we are in for the long haul. We've been hearing uh, you know, references to weeks and now months and then perhaps many months. I think we're looking right into 2021 because um, uh, as if we are successful as China has been, it, it does mean that uh, the population is still vulnerable to infection. If you turn to the next slide, we'll just see what are the, uh, the package, the component of, of the intervention. And these are the non-pharmaceutical interventions. If you look at the very top uh, curve there, the black one, thank you, um, that's if we do nothing at all. And in the context of Ireland, uh, Europe, North America, we will see uh, a, a need for intensive care, which is 30 times greater than the available uh, intensive care, which is uh, there at the moment. But by introducing these interventions, case isolation, and as you go down, we're, we're packaging more and more interventions together. Even if you see the bottom one, there, 
case isolation, home quarantine, social distancing. This is what they aimed for in the UK. Uh, and, and what they realized after having sort of aimed for that was that they were still going to have an eightfold greater number of patients requiring intensive care than they would be able to deal with. And, and, and they are now moving over to where Ireland is doing and what other European countries is, is doing, which is to try and achieve the suppression that China did, but with, with a, in a very different social context. Maybe the final slide there. And I think this is just to maybe set the, uh, the, the, the frame for, for this particular um, uh, webinar, because I think uh, as, as we move to uh, Dermot, I think w we could start to think about, we, we've heard so much about w what we need to do uh, in, in Ireland, but what is feasible in resource poor settings? Now, th this is purely my opinion. Uh, it, it isn't based on what I've been reading, but I do believe we're going to see high levels of mortality among the elderly in, in just a few months period in some of the, uh, the poorest countries, we need to be considering what's going to be the impact on, on, on programs, food programs, what's going to be the secondary effects of the epidemic, which is uh, it's going to undermine existing health services and staff. And I do know from my, uh, you know, my contacts with foreign affairs, talking with some people in NGOs, there's a particular concern about uh, how do we protect and support staff uh, what, what are organizations or duties of care and what sort of support can we be giving to governments and beneficiaries? So let me stop there. I've been talking a long time, uh, Nadine. That's great, Rory. Thank you so much. And I think we'd like to hear more. Um, we'd like to come back to some of those points as well. But just to kind of get everybody involved in the conversation and um, just to remind everybody who's here as an attendee that there is a question and answer on the bottom. And if you have any specific questions, please pop them in there and we'll do our best to respond to them. Um, so just moving over to uh, Dermot. So a very different context, um, Dermot, you know, you're, you're sitting in Malawi at the moment um, and obviously um, just kind of all, all of you really trying to think about what's to come rather than what's actually there. So can you give us just an overview of, you know, what is the current situation in Malawi and, you know, what, what's happening in terms of preparedness or, or you know, how, how is it right now? Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and this is a fantastic arrangement. I, I guess we're all going to, out of every crisis, come some benefit. And I think this kind of virtual discussions and virtual meetings, we're going to get better at these things if the internet works. So let's hope. And <laughs> all right. <laughs> right. But uh, I, in the Malawi setting, just to say that look, there's no case yet. Okay? So we're all fine. Everybody's happy. No, of course not. And um, I guess, you know, the, the big difficulty in, in this situation is that there's a, a few cases in surrounding areas. It's very much a Chinese, European sort of um, issue. Um, it's been difficult to uh, get uh, political support for this. And I think what's really needed here is not just leadership, but we need presidential leadership because the kinds of measures that need to be applied, the kinds of stuff that um, Rory was speaking about. And in this sitting, the timing at which you apply these measures. So you're kind of saying you've got to come across as if you're overreacting to the situation, which at the moment is no cases. Is that the truth? That is definitely not the truth. And we should be overreacting. And that requires that's a big, these are big, bold political actions, and they cannot come from a Minister of Health or a Minister of Education. It has to come from a, from a president. And we're seeing it slowly happening, and we hope that this kind of peer in Zambia, and it's happened in Zimbabwe, um, South Africa is also sort of waking up to this whole thing, and maybe that will come across here, but that's the first thing. Um, this, it's the presidential leadership that's needed for us to begin to perhaps get a little bit ahead of this virus. And the second issue, I think, is that um, don't, in this setting, we shouldn't be, um, I guess, 
um, lulled into a sense of assurance because we've got good medical um, good medical people, good Ministry of Health people, good NGOs and UN agencies around here. That's not going to cut the mustard here. It really has to enter into the political arena. And um, in general, health guys are not big political hitters. And I guess the, related to that, um, and I'm bringing these two issues up um, because they are playing out here, is that um, it also matters a lot where you are in the political cycle. So for example, in Malawi, this is a year post-elections. The, po the election was contested in court. The court nullifies first in Africa. No, it's not, it happened in Kenya. Um, and then there's a huge, huge effort um, happening within political parties and they are completely and utterly distracted by party politics. And so we're sitting around here saying, guys, guys, you know, there's, uh, there's some real serious stuff happening around here and um, it's gonna affect every aspect of our lives. So I guess what we're doing is we're moving into what are the alternatives for us? How does the tail wag the dog? Um, so we're beginning to kind of look at what are our options, interfaith leadership, working with journalists, and in many ways leading by example. So, so we, we are taking drastic measures in the embassy. Um, we are splitting up into two shifts, at, at initially the two teams that never meet each other. We are asking our partners, what are you doing about preparedness and contingency? And and that's starting to spread and we're seeing that a lot of organizations, a lot of agencies, all of whom have some influence are beginning to take on these measures this week. Um, so maybe that'll work and maybe that'll find its way up into um, sort of the highest level of political leadership in the country. Then with regard to programming, these are also very interesting things. Um, you know, we're in the aid business here as well as the political business um, and although we're not involved in the health sector in Malawi um, we a, we've come to a, uh, we've been able to come to a, a um, sensible decision that it doesn't matter if we're in health or not because mm -hmm. whether we're doing agriculture or education or whatever this this epidemic will have a, a serious effect on all of the results that we are chasing here so we have already managed to um, mobilize money that has got nothing to do with its original allocation for health mm -hmm. to make a, a contribution to the national response to COVID very much around preparedness and, and the early, early phases of containment. But what's really important about it is that the quick money is the valuable money. Right. And um, we've sort of been doing the rounds to find out who's got money and the World Bank, they've got money anyway. They're not named people and organizations, but People are out there saying, yes, we can help. We can help six weeks, gonna take two months, that's far too late. And so the quick money is the, is the real value for money. And um, so what we're doing is we're saying, it's possible to get quick money and we're gonna show you how to do it. And hopefully we can, and you know, really show that um, this, it, this is a useful way to spend money that was destined for other aspects of our work. And then maybe responding directly to some of the issues that um, Rory alluded to, it's really the reality of people's lives here. Mm -hmm. And the, really the prospect of uh, self-isolation, I think anybody who knows what living conditions are like in, in, uh, for most of the people, in, certainly in urban areas, and there's a lot of people in urban areas here, mm -hmm. is uh, you know, the average number of people living in houses, the size of houses, um, the, the proximity of houses to each other. Self-isolation is just very, very difficult. And as a measure, I mean, essentially what you're going to say is you're going to confine the infection to those bunch of housing, uh, the COVID virus. And then, of course, obviously the health system, um, it's, uh, uh, it's at best already stressed. Um, there are very few isolation facilities. These were really put in place for Ebola preparedness. Um, if we get a few cases, that's it over. Um, and then uh, even, in, even if you manage to kind of say, well, it's not about isolation places, but barrier nursing and do what you can. Um, and uh, even things like um, oxygen already 
just without the sort of surge in demand that we would uh, we are expecting is not always available and that would be a nice way to put it yeah. Um, and oxygen is about as far as you go in a setting like this, um, ventilation, that's just not going to happen. Um, so yeah, I think um, it's going to be difficult to stem this and flatten the curve and delay it as uh, um, Rory was putting. It's going to be difficult, but it's worth the effort. Um, once it takes hold, um, uh, the system, the health system will be overwhelmed. Homes will be overwhelmed. Um, and we can expect you know, significant death rates. Now, we're yeah. not too sure what the mortality pattern will look like in a place like uh, Malawi, where 10% of the population is on antiretrovirals. Um, uh, you know, young people are walking around uh, uh, with parasites and malarias and anemias and, and, and micronutrient deficiencies yeah. and the like. But it, let's just say there's a theoretical risk that uh, things could, yeah. But maybe if I can end up with one question back to Rory from a, a technical perspective. So for example, in China, um, they've done pretty well, two days, no cases. Um, can it bounce mm -hmm. back? Well, let's, you know? um, Dory, yeah. let's leave it yeah. for one second. I mean, I think that's really important. And I think hopefully we, we, we get to just discuss that a little bit. But, you know, just coming over to Nile, um, you know, kind of coming back closer to home here. And you're talking about, you know, isolation measures and the things that we're doing and not doing and struggling with um, here in Ireland at the, at the moment. You know, Niall, um, what do you think in terms of, you know, environmental health measures? What do we need to be really vigilant about during this containment phase? What have you seen yourself? Um, and, you know, you have a lot of experience experience um, working on this and now suddenly here we are in Ireland um, struggling with these things. Uh, the key thing, well thanks again everyone for, for in, in initiating this uh, webinar. I suppose the first thing I'd like to say is that um, the key thing here in Ireland what's happening is, is about behaviour change. I think we talk a lot about doctors and nurses at the front line and yes they are the front line but actually the key to preventing this or to flattening the curve is, is actual individual family and community behaviors. And I think what has been really, really important in Ireland has been the way the message has been communicated, who it has been communicated by. Dermot mentioned political leadership. I think we have had political leadership in Ireland. We're making, making decisions early. Uh, and I think like, and like what Mike Ryan was saying in the WHO, don't be afraid to fail, just act and act with speed and be proactive and not reactive. And I think that's one of the things I think that has been highlighted to me in Ireland is how I'm, I'm impressed with the health system and the HSE in terms of how we are responding uh, quickly. Uh, we may not achieve the levels of, of, of suppression that we want, but we are acting proactively. And I think that's a very important thing to say. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about low-income low countries as well, but maybe just for some of the stuff in terms of environmental health here in Ireland, um, I have been quite appalled, and we, we had a, a letter published in the Irish Times today, because at the moment, because we have closed down the schools, we have closed down restaurants, we have closed down pubs, so there are very few points or places in our community where people congregate. And the key points for congregation uh, and transmission, infectious disease transmission, is supermarkets and pharmacies and other food stores. Yeah. And I think we need to be very vigilant in those supermarkets. Uh, the guidelines are not terribly strict at the moment. I was in two different supermarkets yesterday, chalk and cheese, one very slapdash, hardly anything at all, no information, education and communication messages, no messages over the tannoy, uh, very little uh, messages about the social distance, particularly around checkouts. But the other one then was good. They had sneeze screens over the checkouts. They had clearly demarcated areas and where you, you stand when you're checking out, keeping your distance from those who are serving you the food, that kind of stuff was there. If I just quickly to list off some of the stuff that I would like to see here in Ireland in relation to supermarkets is having controlled entry and exit based upon the floor space that is available within the shop so you're not overcrowded. I think overcrowding is critically important in this and that brings up other issues around ventilation which I think is another environmental health issue that perhaps we haven't been thinking enough about in terms of uh, the behaviours that we need to adopt in our own households. Disinfecting trolleys and baskets so we're not in contact with, with uh, surfaces that have been contaminated. 
hand sanitizers, I think, on entry and on exit. I would like to see more or hear more public announcements, posters reminding customers and the staff to maintain their social distance. Even the supermarket is in yesterday. I saw three staff chatting away and they were all right on top of each other stacking the shelves. They, they should be maintaining their distance as well. Clear demarcation for social distance at the service counters and the checkouts. Clear cleaning procedures, which I think there should be a focus on critical control points. We talk in hygiene promotion, we talk about hazard analysis, critical control points. And that would be uh, issues around even where you pin in your debit card number. That area should be cleaned after every transaction, I think, and also in the self-service points as well. Baked goods being covered. <laughs> you can't wash a croissant or a donut or a baguette when you go home. You can wash a bag of potatoes or you can wash your potatoes, but you can't wash a baguette. Uh, sneeze or cough shields at service points and checkouts. There seems to be some confusion among staff about using gloves, whether it's good to use gloves or not to use gloves. My understanding is that gloves are not very useful, that you should not be wearing gloves. And then some supermarkets are introducing stuff around handling cash and not right. to be handing notes and coins. These are all kind of practical, kind of detailed procedures I think we need to be seeing in our supermarkets in order to reduce that infectious, potentially infectious environment that we all go to. And then, of course, ensuring that older people have a particular time for shopping. Uh, those of us who can, like myself yesterday, I was shopping for my own parents so they don't even have to go to the shop. Right. Or we have the facility here in Ireland, uh, which maybe Dearman doesn't have in Malawi, is to shop online. If right. we can shop online. That's yeah, just... And I see that shopping online, a lot of the slots are already gone all the way through mm -hmm. April at this point. Yeah. <laughs> really? Wow. That's, that's just at, a, at an Ireland level. Now, maybe you want to go back to the other panelists before I talk about get on my wash. Yeah, well, I, I mean, just while, while we're with you, Niall, you know, you have a lot of experience. You yourself have worked in, in Malawi as well. So I just think it's interesting just, you know, just the, the contrast. I mean, what is your, um, what are your concerns in relation to um, water sanitation? And what, what do, do people need to be thinking about, for instance, in Malawi? What could you, what could, what kind of advice could you give? Um, yeah, sure. Well, we'll, we'll look at wash, water, sanitation and hygiene. And I, I, I always look at it in a broader context of environmental health and broader kind of public health. And I think it's really, really important for those who are working in WASH or coordinating with the other sectors or other clusters that we work in. So when I was working in UNICEF in Malawi, I had the nutrition cluster right across from me. And, I, and Dermot mentioned there about the issues about people who are malnourished or suffering from micronutrient de deficiencies and what effect does the COVID-19 virus have on those? I don't know, but we need to be connecting with them. The C4D, uh, communication for development section is another important avenue for communicating health messages uh, the education section obviously also if stuff has been still going on in, in schools um, and the health sector sector also as well so we need to be in coordination because this is a humanitarian emergency it's not what i'm normally used to responding to i've never responded to the ebola crisis and i'm not and I've, to some extent cholera i'm not normally responding to conflict or, or natural disaster so i think coordination is key and particularly around communication and how we communicate messages, who is delivering that communication, is it a trusted source? Doctors we know in Ireland are the most trusted profession in Ireland and they are the people who are delivering the message. Um, we look at WASH in three different kind of domains or spheres. One is WASH in the community and as I said already I think in the community prevention at the community level is the most critical level where we can suppress uh, the curve. But also washing healthcare facilities also I think is very, very important and washing schools. And I'm going to discard washing schools because I'm going to assume, <laughs> maybe Dermot has knowledge on this in terms of Malawi, whether they're going to close the schools or not, but in Ireland schools are closed. I think I am worried from a wash perspective because wash is a fundamental element of primary healthcare. Yeah. And for years wash has not been funded very well and that is reflected in terms of our coverage in relation to wash. You know, and within WASH, just the good, from the good, the good news, I suppose, is that from the evidence that I have in some of the guidelines, COVID-19 has not transmitted through water or sanitation. So our focus really is around hygiene and hygiene behaviours. And obviously WASH people focus on hand washing, for example, with soap, but there are other behaviours that I'll mention in a minute. But if you look at the data that we have from the joint monitoring programme of UNICEF WHO, Nearly 75% of the population in least developed countries lack hand washing facilities with soap and water. 
So this is a, a behavior we are promoting, but people are not enabled to wash their hands because they don't physically have the hand washing facilities. Right. And we know from some of the data we have that less than 20% of people, this is a global estimate, wash their hands with soap and water after going to the toilet, for example. So we're already starting at a very low base in terms of existing behavior. Um, I mentioned kind of other behaviors that we need to try, and try to promote. And again, the communication will be important around that, social distancing, coughing, sneezing etiquette, yeah. avoiding yeah. gatherings. And even my own self now on Monday, I'm going to a funeral and it's going to have to be organized in a particular way so that we're not overcrowding. Yeah. And even issues around ventilation, because I remember doing my master's thesis on TB and nothing in WHO guidance at the time was on the importance of ventilation right. to try and remove a virus or to re re remove a bacterium from it. Right. And just to, um, just to let people know who are um, attending this webinar that on our website we are um, taking questions, very specific questions. People have all sorts of questions about um, you know, how long the virus lives, um, you know, ventilation, those kind of things. And we, we have a frequently asked questions document that we're continually updating. So we'll, we'll do that based on the questions that come in here as well. Um, I'm just wondering, um, Rory, if I just come back to you um, and just looking at some of the questions coming in, I mean, in terms of a longer term outlook, I know you mentioned it briefly, but if you could just say something about that. And also, I see a question around, you know, what's the chance of having a second wave? Um, that's that's one, you know, a second wave coming. And then one other would be, you know, how confident are we that that the containment measures that are coming in uh, reported by China are, um, are as we hear them? And I really appreciate that all of us are learning as we go and that we may not know these answers even as, as, as panelists here and if we don't we can find out but just I don't know Rory whatever you you would like to contribute on that. The more successful we are the more in danger we are. Can you unpack that a little bit? Um, China has been remarkably successful um, it's also in a, in a position where it can actually maintain that degree of suppression uh, it, it has a huge population of, uh, if it's say 1.3 billion, 1.29 billion are at risk of, of, of infection. And, and, and because they've been so successful, they know that they could get a, a massive epidemic if they uh, relax their measures. They are in a position where they can maintain those measures. Uh, they have been successful with uh, the suppression. Um, they are, are going to be implementing uh, quarantining. Nobody will be allowed into the country without uh, being quarantined uh, and, and this being enforced the way they can do it uh, for 14 days. And they're such a large country that while, while you know, the impact economically on them uh, will be considerable, uh, they, they can do it. I, I'm I'm more pessimistic about the ability of more open uh, societies like like Ireland and and European countries to do it. And uh, we, we've already seen you know lockdowns uh, happening, and people are going to be starting to try and balance up well the impact of the lockdown of the the, the social impact the the economic impact against uh, well what what is the cost of allowing the epidemic uh, continue um uh, i'm much more pessimistic uh, about the poorest countries i think um sub-saharan africa i just don't think the resources are going to be there to uh, to to successfully suppress uh, this virus it, it's remarkably infectious mm. even in china where uh, it, it, it's not probably the uh, program to follow. Maybe others like Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, uh, Singapore, maybe may better models. I think where there was much more of an uh, emphasis on testing, 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 as we hear from the Director General uh, of the WHO. But uh, even even in, in China, which was uh, with their draconian measures, they they missed fifty percent of cases. Um, uh, you know, the coronavirus uh, it, it can be transmitted, we believe, in the pre-symptomatic phase. We believe there is an asymptomatic uh, transmission. And, and it's quite a low-level disease that a lot of people miss. And that is why the traditional ways of, of, of controlling an epidemic uh, aren't working here. The, the uh, de detection... Um, you know, identifying the case, testing, uh, contact tracing. 
That's why we have to have all these other measures, which uh, you know, Niall has been talking about there, the extreme social distancing. And I think we are really struggling uh, mm -hmm. to do it. I think on a personal level, I feel you know, we're, we're struggling. Yes. You know, as, as a, you know, I, a typical family, a child, yes. uh, elderly parents, uh, parents-in-law. Um, there is a risk that in, in, in Europe, we might just fall between two stools, mm -hmm. uh, that we, we have this ongoing epidemic um uh, we don't really manage to to suppress it effectively like some of the uh, asian countries have been managed managed to do what we will see in africa I, I believe is um quite high levels of mortality over a short period of time mainly affecting the elderly and it'll be a little bit like a storm that will pass through but what it will leave is uh, a a population of people who actually are immune or we hope are immune to uh, to the virus. So you know, um, coming back to what Dermot was saying there, uh, yeah, what what is the risk of a rebound? If if a whole population becomes infected, and up to eighty percent of the population will be infected if we don't do anything effectively, uh, they they will have a, a degree of um, protection. What's the what are we looking? What's the end game? Um, we do need a vaccine now. Uh, Treatments are being developed. Uh, if they're found to be effective, we need to target them towards those who are most at risk, the elderly, the vulnerable, get in the antivirals early in the course of, of the disease to prevent the complications. And you can see huge problems around distribution, around competition for resources, uh, competition for, you know, and, and, and this is going to be within countries and between countries, between rich and poor. Mm -hmm. um, a vaccine, uh, some very knowledgeable people are saying 18 months to, to the point where you're really rolling it out. Uh, we are in there for the long haul. Some people, I see Adrian Hill in, in, in Oxford, there's a very good vaccine group there, believe that uh, actually we could be rolling out at least to some degree uh, before the end of the year. Uh, so people are going to have to kind of change their whole perspective on, on how they live their lives, we're going to have to change our perspective about how we run our economies uh, and, and, and start to think, no, it's, this is not just until the end of the school holidays and we hit the summer and we all come back to normal in the autumn. Um, one, uh, I, and I will send around one more resource, maybe, which I haven't sent around already. Some people will have read about the Imperial College study. Yes. Uh, it, it's quite a, an eye opener. One of the things that they suggest is that we, we, we may have to be really very intensive with our, our interventions, the point where we're suppressing, but at some points along the way, we're going to need to relax them, yeah. uh, but be vigilant and bring them in again. So we may see, um, I, I, I think, a, a more targeted approach, uh, an approach which is learning from what's working and what's not working, um, and we're going to be need to be balancing the, you know, the health of a minority of vulnerable people. We need to think of the human rights dimensions. Right. We need to think of social cohesion. I think these are the things we need to be looking at in Africa, which is particularly yeah. protecting uh, what we have achieved so far, protecting the health workers. There's 25%, uh, I think, or 20% of those infected in Ireland yeah. uh, you know, have been health workers. And I think development agencies need to be thinking about where they're putting the resources because it's not only the epidemic and, 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 and who it directly affects, it's these secondary effects uh, yes. that we really need to be looking out for. Thanks, Rory. And I think, you know, just talking about vulnerable groups, I've been on calls this week where, you know, just looking around social inclusion in Ireland and how can we make sure that we are, our messages are going out to the most vulnerable groups in Ireland, our travellers population, um, our homeless population, and um, what are the challenges with that? So I think, you know, as as as, a, as we're, we're moving, I think that these issues are the same in, in many countries, just at different uh, different stages. Um, we've lost Dermot there for a minute, so maybe Niall, I'll just come back to you until we get uh, Dermot back. And yeah. And yeah, just, just, uh, again, just reminding everybody there's a question and answers box and we'll do our best to answer some of them on the panel and the rest we will answer on our frequently asked questions document. Go ahead now. Yeah, just to highlight what, what uh, Rory was just saying there about protecting health workers. And again, I mentioned earlier on about washing the community, but also washing healthcare facilities is also critically important in terms of infection prevention and control. 
And the 2019 Joint Monitoring Programme Report of WHO and UNICEF says that 896 million people use healthcare facilities with no water supply, 1.5 billion use facilities with no sanitation service, and they don't actually give the number of facilities that don't have adequate hand hygiene facilities and safe waste management facilities as well. So I think there's a huge amount of work to be done in healthcare facilities in supporting infection control, right. infection prevention and control for staff and also for, for patients. And I think also this is just to highlight this is like, I think this is a cross-cutting mainstream issue as we might call it in, in development circles, but it's also a protection issue. Yeah, we talk a lot in mainstreaming protection in humanitarian emergencies. This is actually a protection issue. Maybe not from sexual exploitation and abuse. I'm sure there's been an element of that as well, probably as well. But this is a protection issue. So all development agencies in Ireland, I know, take protection very seriously. And I think we need to just visualise that protection is, 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 is a bigger issue. And this is a protection issue in terms of protecting staff, all staff, but also the beneficiaries that they work, in, work with, no matter what sector they work in, whether there's livelihoods or education or or wash or, or health or whatever. I think um, there are a couple of key messages I want to get across. Yeah, thank you, Niall. Um, Dermot, you've come back on there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. We'll try and get your video back on. Um, but just in the meantime, I mean, there's quite a few questions coming up in the chat box that we can um, we can talk about later. You know, questions around, um, you know, test kits. Um, are test kits, are you, are you kind of helping? Are you involved in sourcing of them? A personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. Um, how are you thinking ahead in terms of that? Um, but also just a broader question in terms of, you know, how can how can we in Ireland support you um, as, as you're kind of, you know, as, as you start to deal with what we've already been dealing with um yeah um yeah um on uh, with regard to um requirements i think that uh, the country is quite clear there's a lot of technical input into um the phases of of uh, inputs and um that are required and um, if the um, early money is mobilized it'll be used very well and it is and we it looks like um the stuff is available um Your internet is freezing on us a little bit, Dermot. Mm -hmm. Which I think it shows one of the challenges that there's going to be for a country like Malawi, where we're able to swap to um, to online and to communicate like this. And clearly that's going to be a, a big challenge uh, for Malawi. Um, Dermot, hopefully we'll, we'll get you back. Um, we'll get you back as soon as we can. Um, I'm thinking that it would be good just to, we have 70 people attending this webinar and thank you for those of you who are um, putting in questions. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's anybody who would like to, if you'd like to raise your hand, there's a hand raising your hand feature, you can raise your hand and we might be able to come to you and you can just either ask a question or, uh, or make a comment. And I'm gonna ask everybody to be very brief. Um, so please do that and we'll try and uh, we'll try and come to you. Um, I'm just wondering if any, while we're doing that, if there's any panellists who know anything about COVID and pregnancy. And um, that was one question and we may not. And if not, we can find out. And the other is there was a question around um, wondering if, if the impact in low income countries is likely to be less because there's fewer older people. Um, maybe Rory, I don't know if you have anything to any, any insight on that. Um. Uh, yeah. No problem. <laughs> uh, yes, Nadine. Um, uh, you know the the demography is different, and, and maybe just the expectations uh, around what what the health services uh, can deliver is different. I mean, many of the countries that we work in, uh, in in a way, have uh, experienced the impact of uh, a, a a disease and infection, which. Uh, over a longer period of time has, has had a greater impact than perhaps uh, COVID will, and that's, uh, that's HIV. Uh, and, and it was a, a very unnatural infection, uh, the impact on, on young adults, whereas um, the, the uh, COVID is, 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 is largely going to impact on the health of um, older people. Um, uh, it also, I think, as I said, I think, I think the impact will be very, very, very rapid uh, because it'll be difficult to uh, introduce uh, testing on a very uh, wide scale. 
uh, in, in resource poor countries. Yeah. And maybe just one additional factor, but we don't really know um, how, how important this might be, but just picking up on what Dermot was saying there, uh, in terms of uh, uh, treatments that might have some mitigating effect, both uh, antiretrovirals, I believe, have been suggested as uh, yeah. possibly having a mitigating effect, and antimalarials. Right. So I think there's quite, probably quite a lot to be learnt. Um, and and yeah. be, because there are so few resources, I don't think we're going to see as much of the painful decisions around prioritization and, and, and rationing. You know, rationing would become a real issue in, in, in European countries and, and in North America around who gets those ventilators if, we, if, right. if the epidemic uh, goes beyond the surge capacity of the health system. I, I don't think those are going to be uh, questions in the same way uh, in, in a country that might have you know, 20 ventilators for a population of uh, 20 million people. Right. Yeah, thank you, Rory. And I think, um, Anne Matthews, thank you. You're just saying there are new good guidelines on pregnancy, um, which we will then put up on our website. And thank you for that. And I just noticed there's a, um, a message in from Ashley Scott in South Africa, just saying that they've acted very quickly within the last week in terms of social distancing. But with that quick response became panic. It came panic. And that's causing a lot of stigma and discrimination. You know, people being refused transport because they're coughing. And um, I think it's a very good point. How do we keep people informed with good and accurate information? without having people avoiding testing and treatment due to stigma and discrimination um, and I think for me that also speaks to self-stigma where you know we know that if you are stigmatizing yourself you, you feel uh, very fearful or you feel like you're going to be judged and you might try to hide what what um, what what's going on so I think keeping the conversation open and I think one thing I'm noticing in Ireland is that it's it's a very open conversation everybody is talking about um, getting testing and I think the contact tracing is really helping with that because it's just a systematic contact tracing um, being carried out. Um, Dermot, I don't know if you want to say anything. Um, you were talking a little bit there um, and you got cut off just in terms of how, for instance, Irish could support uh, Malawi. I think you were saying that you're, you're okay in terms of your, your kind of sourcing the test kits and the, the protective gear. Yeah, and, and I think this, you know, the, the the early rapid stuff, which is of course going to, as, as Rory was saying, that's, that's the where it might help. Um, because it, you, one can expect that this is, is going to be a, a, a high peak wave coming through quickly. And um, yeah, so what also um, with regard to what we, can, what we can benefit from Ireland is actually learning from Ireland, you know. And uh, I keep in touch with the HAC guys. I, um, I, on your um, the um, global globalhealth.ie website, which is very very useful, um, yeah, and in touch with basically um, some of our other embassies, just learning from uh, what's going on in the other countries. So, but with regard to money, and that's not a big issue at the moment because the uh, the amount of money that's needed is huge amounts of money, which should have been here last year. And it has built up the whole system. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Dermot. And, uh, yeah. I'm just noticing a number of the um, questions and comments are just coming in around mental health, the psychological impact of people, um, you know, not just in terms of, of, of loss, in terms of losing people, but also in terms of being kept, you know, being at home, being isolated and um, looking at the potential rise in, uh, in, in abuse um, and just, you know, tensions, tensions rising and just um, somebody asking, you know, how do we prepare for that and what can we do about that? Um, Niall, over to you. So you just wanted to get in there. Yeah, just I just want to stress how important communication is in in, in developing country terms. We refer to behaviour change communication. And I think that it's really, really, really important. I think key for a lot of us in this is people like behavioural psychologists, anthropologists, people who are engaged in social marketing. They're all really important. It's important also to avoid a panic. <laughs> And like you just mentioned there in terms of mental health, we don't want people to have anxiety or mental stress issues no. if we have a message that is very fearful. We want to give a message that enables people to have control over their own health protection. And I think I cannot stress it enough that this is so important in terms of how we communicate these health messages in order to promote health. We promote health through education. 
And you can see how many people in Ireland have adopted those behaviors. Yeah. But there are some groups of people who maybe have not necessarily. And the messages that were coming out yesterday, I think from Tony Hulhan, the, the, the head in the HSE, was trying to appeal to younger people, not so much to protect themselves, but how they can protect their loved ones, such as their grandparents. And I think in, in, in all settings, it is really, really important that we communicate effectively. And clearly there's going to be some element of how we promote health through the enforcement of legislation or laws. You, we can see it in Italy. You can't move around unless you have a piece of paper. I don't know if we're going to get to that stage yet in Ireland, but I know the police have been ramping up. Uh, and that is another way in which we promote health. But it's probably not the way that we want to promote health in the yeah. best way. And we don't want to create fear. No, and I think, you know, that fear, you know, I, I you know, I'm, I work a lot with them, um, with, with people around their thoughts and their thinking. And I think that, you know, there's the virus and then there is the virus of fear that is spread, you know, that's spread in our minds. It's spread in the way we use language. You know, I've seen a couple of things like war on COVID and, and those kind of things. And we learned a lot about that kind of language with, with HIV. And I think um, just making sure that even individually, you know, each of us are, are you know, we, we have a responsibility and an opportunity, in fact, to to, um, to really not spread fear, not spread the virus of fear. Um, I know we have David Weekly in with us, um, and if we could make David a panelist, um, I would love to um, just uh, just speak to him briefly. Um, David, as most of you will know, is the um, the lead for global health in the HSE, and he's obviously been uh, been been very busy and, and deployed very well there. David, hi, how are you? Can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. Hi, hi. Yeah, so maybe, David, just to kind of give you the floor, really, in terms of you've heard from Dermot and, and Rory, and we've brought in some questions, and Niall, and um, we'd just love to hear your perspective, anything you would like us to hear in terms of your thoughts on global health. We know that you're in the, you know, you're dealing with a lot in terms of Ireland at the moment, but also connecting with our other co country partners in Mozambique and, and other countries. So over to you. Yeah, th thanks, Nadine, and thanks, everyone. I've not heard all of the discussion. I've had to kind of dip in and out. My phone is kind of ringing frequently, so I've not I've missed the various bits and and maybe just a few reflections, uh, just maybe to what well, I adjust my camera here. Uh, that from from an Irish point of view, I think the points have been very well made, and uh, I appreciate the. The description of the approach that that we need here, and I think uh, Niall's points about uh, in relation to hygiene, etc., really critical. I mean, I think if we go think about it at the most basic level, that the way to to control the spread is if people who have it are separated from the people who don't have it. And so, to me, there's the actions around this. It's mainly it's social distancing and it's the hygiene measures that we've heard. And so there you might say that's two actions. Actually in Ireland, that's 10 million actions because that's 5 million people doing the two actions. And I think the, the key to this is that this is something that will work if it's implemented 100%. Other countries take an enforcement approach. Maybe we've not gone down that route to that extent here, but this is what we need a whole of population response to this. And I think if something, if we can convey across all of society that this is something that's in all of our hands, then I think this is, this is the key. And, and suppression is still, is still possible. I mean, with regard to low-income countries, I mean, I, I would go along with what I've heard others say about the likely development there. And I think whatever challenges we face in Ireland, then you can obviously add to that with countries with less resources. And I think that Dermot made the point about leadership, and I think our experience with previous situations comparable to this is that leadership at the highest level in countries is a very, very key determinant of how well countries respond. Yeah. We saw that with the HIV epidemic, we've seen it in other situations as well. So I think that at this stage, having that uh, strong leadership before this takes hold in countries is hopefully something that will have some kind of good effect in the longer term. And I mean, then just conscious of resource limitations, it's remembering for these countries, what can be done without requiring huge amounts of resources? Mm -hmm. And where, when you have limited resources, what, is, what do you use those resources for? So I think the, the population health measures like social distancing and good hygiene, these are things that we can all do. So I think very, very good public education is going to be key at this point. 
And there's a lot of talk at the moment about testing, testing, testing. And yes, if countries can test, it does help a lot in terms of drawing attention to the presence of the infection and galvanizing action. Uh, it's not going to be feasible, I expect, in many countries mm -hmm. to do the kind of scale of testing you want. And, but, and, but I think testing is, is something that, that is part of the response and one of the measures that I think countries should be looking to, to do to scale up, really to help them get a hold of managing the response because without information, it can be harder to take strong action. So, so I think they're just the, maybe the few things I'd say just from the top of my head, just after coming in at this point. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Thanks for coming in. Um, so I think we're, um, you know, we're coming, we're coming to the end of, um, of, of what we can do in this hour. Um, we want to make sure that this is something that we are able to offer every week, just as this is unfolding. I think, you know, all of us are in the same boat in terms of, you know, we're just doing the best we can to keep on top of the best information um, and, and, you know, respond in, in, in the way that we can. Um, I see that people are asking on the webinar, you know, on the, on the questions, you know, what can we do? What can I NGOs do? Um, how can we support? Um, so maybe just one very last quick comment from each of the panelists and then back to, uh, to Hal. I think we'll need to finish up. So Niall, if we could start with you. You know, I just want to highlight because I know there are WASH people <laughs> uh, online and listening to this, just to highlight that we have compiled a number of resources through the Global WASH cluster and they provide the materials from Sphere, the Interagency Standing Committee, UNICEF, WHO and others including stuff on environmental health in, in essential environmental health standards and healthcare facilities from WHO in 2008. So I just wanted to highlight that those resources are already out there and we in the Irish Global Health Network can act as a repository for those yeah. uh, resources. Yeah. And we're really, really open and willing. If people have requests, please ask us what you need. Ask us questions. We will continue to update on that frequently asked questions and respond in any way we can. Uh, Dermot from Malawi, any last words? I'm asking you to be very brief and thank you for that. Yeah, um, there's, there are a lot of Irish NGOs who are super capable and what uh, they should be doing, what the guys are doing here in Malawi is repurposing, doing exactly what Niall's talking about, communication, Watching your hands, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dermot, and thank you so much for joining us. Rory, how about you? Just Hi. Just a last um, word, anything to, uh, anything to offer? Uh, Father Michael Kelly uh, calls education the, you know, the, the vaccine against HIV. And I think the, the vaccine before we have a vaccine is accurate information. Social vaccine, I love the way he says <laughs> Social that. vaccine. Yeah. I would like to say uh, something we haven't talked about, but anxiety. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think we feel, I feel it on a personal level, yes. uh, trying, trying to balance you know, work, uh, a child, uh, yes. not, not putting an elderly parents-in-law in danger, um, and the professional anxiety, am I, am I doing enough? You know, uh, there are my colleagues like David out there you know, at the cold face. Um, and I think we all just need to be kind to ourselves and kind to, to others. This, this is very stressful. And maybe just as a final, I, it's not quite humorous, it, it, is, it is quite serious. You somebody really wants loud to, as well, just to, just to know we're allowed to laugh. We should laugh. Good. Yeah. Uh, if somebody wants to do a, a count of uh, the, the speakers, how many times they uh, touch their faces, twick their ears, their, their, their chins. I think uh, and Niall and I are sort of uh, up there. I don't know which, I don't know who. I'm, uh, I'm the worst. Count. I'm the worst. Mainly your ears, Niall, you went for, whereas I. <laughs> <laughs> Rory, you're actually you're okay. better than us. Yeah, yeah, Good, yeah. I love that. Uh, thank All you, right. Rory and David. Any last words before I don't touch my face? Yes. Uh, David, you're muted you at the moment. Somebody unmute. needs to unmute him. Yes, Ellen, can you? Sir? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, no, I think I, I've only just came in at the end, so they probably yeah, were my last words for now. But we, okay, we, well, I look forward. But let's keep the keep the discussions going. I think this exchange I found has been very, very useful, and I think like Rory talked about, you know, the anxiety we can be supporting each other. I think this is a very useful forum for doing that. Yeah. This is a place where the kind of the global health community in Ireland and beyond can come together. So let's use the opportunity and, and let's let let us know between each other what, what our needs are. How can we yes. support each other? And I think Nadine, you and your team, you're doing a fantastic job with information. Yep. Let's hear from people what kind of information is useful to people as something that will support them because 
that will also help with anxiety levels if we feel there's those supports around us. So yeah. thanks for that. Good. Thanks, David. And I think just in terms of, you know, you, you're right, Rory, you know, what more can we do? And I think there was the HSC put out a call looking for health, health care workers, health professionals and social care, you know, people in social care offering to uh, to sign up and, and offer their services. And that's a, there's a link on our website on our COVID-19 page for that, which is just something practical people can do. Um, so good. Hala, back to you. Okay, thank you everyone for this really informative uh, session. I guess everyone really uh, got some clarity today. So thank you for the speakers. Thank you, Nadine, and thank you for the, uh, our attendees. Uh, Ellen, can you put the slide, please? So we are going to continue, as we said, as we mentioned, we are going to continue on these uh, webinars uh, every, every Friday at 1 p.m. GMT or Irish time and for any questions and if you have any topics you want to suggest please send us to our uh, email info at ester.ie and uh, we have as we mentioned we have there is a dedicated web page for coronavirus frequently asked questions we will add the questions that you have asked and we didn't have a chance to answer them there and also more questions that will be added there frequently and uh, this recording of the of the webinar will be available on our website www.globalhealth.ie and www.ester.eu uh, by this, I will wrap and, uh, the webinar. So thank you, everyone, and we are looking to forward to hear from you. And thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank, well. thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. See you. See you.